Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Biology 3310 or 4310. It's Virology. My name is Vincent Racaniello, and I'm happy to start teaching you about this wonderful world. So this is me. This is my email. You are welcome anytime to ask me questions, either here, of course, or by email. Don't hesitate. I strongly believe in using social media to teach, so I'm, a, I'm big on the internet. There's my Twitter ID and Google+. I use this to educate the world about viruses, because I think it's really important that people understand how they work, because 99.99% .99 of the world doesn't get it, as you'll see in this course. Uh, I'm going to be helped in this course by my colleague, Professor Saul Silverstein, who's sitting up there in the back. He's the younger looking of the two of us. So Saul and I are, have labs up at the medical center here at Columbia. Between us, I think we've been working on viruses for over 70 years. So we bring a lot of experience to this. And this is something we do out of our own volition, teach this course. We want to tell you about viruses. We're also going to be helped by uh, a teaching assistant, Ashley Bennett, who's in the back there. Do avail yourself of her expertise. Ashley is a PhD student in my lab uh, working on viruses. A couple of details about course mechanics and so forth. I keep all the information about the course on two different websites. I use CourseWorks, and I also have my own uh, handcrafted site, which is here, for those of you that don't like course, CourseWorks. So there you'll find the schedule for every lecture. It's already up. Before each lecture, I'll post a PDF of all the slides, so you can download them and have them here if you want. There are also some suggested readings that I put up there, mainly from my blog, as I'll tell you in a moment. I record each of these lectures, both the slides and the audio. I put that up at these two sites and also on iTunes. And you can use that on your computer, your iPad, your phone, whatever. It works on all the devices. So you can listen to every lecture. Usually they're posted uh, the day or a day or two after we do them here. Uh, how we're going to grade is also explained there briefly. There are three exams, two during the course and one at the end. They are not cumulative. They only cover the previous lectures since the first exam. So the final is not really a final. It's just the last part of the course. There are weekly online quizzes at CourseWorks. These are very brief, maybe three questions per lecture that just make sure you're keeping up with the material. It will take you 10 minutes to do it. I really would like you to do it within the week after you have the lecture. So the, today, there's, this week, there's just one lecture. Sunday night, I'll put up three questions. Do it sometime next week. And that way, you keep up. It's really easy. Most of the questions come from the slides. I just want to make sure that you're understanding the material. OK, so you can find more about that at uh, CourseWorks. I suggest that you do take this textbook, Principles of Virology. It's not required for the course. I suggest strongly because it will really help you understand things a lot better. Uh, I wrote it along with four other uh, virologists. This course is built around that textbook, as you will see. So if you don't understand something that I or Dr. Silverstein says, for sure you will get it in the textbook. So that's if you think you need it go ahead and buy that. If not, you don't need it for the course. On the exams, they will only ask you about things that we tell you here in lecture. So there would be nothing from the book. But of course, the book does cover what we do in lecture as well. I also would like you to look at two of my online activities. So as I said, I'm going to be making assignments for each lecture, brief blog posts for you to read. I write these once or twice a week about current issues in virology. I want you to get immersed in virology as much as you can, because that's the best way to understand it. It's an amazing field. We're very enthusiastic about it. I love writing about it. So when you have a moment, uh, read these posts that I assign. We also do every week a podcast, which I sit down with three or four of my virology colleagues, and we have conversations about viruses. This is called This Week in Virology. 
If you listen to one of these now and then, you'll find it really uh, helps you understand virology in general. In fact, a good experiment to do would be to listen to one now and then listen to one at the end of the course and see if, how much more that you understand. So this is a really popular podcast. It has over 10,000 subscribers at the moment from all over the world, mostly non-virologists. So we try to keep it at a, at a very low level. So here's the blog. It's at virology.ws. Uh, and again, very short posts, all less than a, a thousand words, which really uh, are my analysis of what's going on in the world of virology. And you can find the podcasts here. They also have uh, their own website, This Week in Virology. And again, each week we do this. We record on Fridays and post on Sundays. And um, this is a really good way to learn virology. So I want you to immerse yourself in it. I know you're busy, but whenever you have a moment, people tell me they play this when they cook and they get really good food as a result. So check it out. Okay, so let's start talking about viruses. Just for uh, my information, how many of you have had a virus infection? It's everyone's hand should be up, right? Because all of you have been infected, may be infected right now. There's a very good chance that we all are because viruses are all over the place. We're always inhaling them. We're always eating them in your food. If you had some nice vegetables for lunch today, they were probably had some insect viruses on them that crawl over the vegetables while they're growing. They're totally harmless, but you are ingesting them. Uh, they're just everywhere, and the numbers are spectacular. We're going to learn more about that in this course. We have viral genomes in our genetic material. Each one of us do. We have it in our germline, so we've inherited these from our parents, and we're going to pass them on to our kids as well. And viruses infect every living thing on the planet. And only until recently have viruses of, say, um, C. elegans or other organisms been discovered, but they exist. And if we don't know of one, it's because we haven't looked hard enough. So every species of organism has its own virus. The numbers here are just astounding, and I want to give you a sense for how many viruses are on this planet. Just bacteriophages alone, so these are viruses that infect bacteria, and here is one specific kind. They're called the T-even phages. They look like a DNA injecting machine. The world's water supplies, there are 10 to the 30th bacteriophages present. This is a huge number. So let's, let me illustrate in two ways how big this is. So a, a phage weighs about a femtogram. So if you multiply that times 10 to the 30th, you get a biomass that exceeds that of elephants by a thousand fold. I know one day I'm not going to be able to use this anymore because there won't be any, any elephants left. But that's huge. And these are viruses that you cannot see. So their weight is, so that just tells you how many there are. So by the way, in the oceans, per teaspoon of ocean water, there are about 5 million virus particles. So the next time you go swimming, you will remember that and realize that your body is awash in all kinds of viruses. But we've been doing this for years, and we're fine, so it's not a problem. Now, if you take these 10 to the 30th phages and you line them up end to end, someone did the calculation, that line of phages would stretch 200 million light years. This is a long way. Okay, 200 million light years. So just to illustrate that, our, our nearest spiral galaxy, Andromeda, is two and a half million light years away. So the phages go way beyond this. Just to give you a sense of how, how many there are on the planet. It happened to my visuals. <clears throat> I think this happened last year too, right? And a projector. <laughs> no, it's a Mac. It doesn't have a virus. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Where were we? Okay, whales. So whales are infected with a, a little RNA virus called the Calissi virus. And these, these viruses can cause rashes and gastroenteritis in the whales. Sometimes they infect us. We will talk about um, gastroenteritis caused by members of this family of viruses. 
the whales excrete 10 to the 13th particles per day. Each whale, 10 to the 13th. So the next time you see one of those really nice Discover movies with a whale swimming through the ocean, just realize there's a stream of virus particles coming from behind it. And these contribute to the, the total number of particles in the ocean. Now right today on the planet, there are 10 to the 16th HIV genomes. That is the genetic material of human immunodeficiency virus. And that's also a big number. Here's why. Uh, here's an illustration of why it's so big. So we have about 20, more than 20 antiretroviral drugs to treat people who are infected with HIV, people who have AIDS. And in these 10 to the 16th genomes, there are already resistance mutations to all of those antiretrovirals circulating. Plus, even if we keep di discovering new drugs every year, forever, all the resistance is already out there. That's how big that number is, 10 to the 16th genomes. So we have huge numbers of, of viruses around us all the time. But really, most of us are OK. We're pretty healthy. And that's because we have a great immune system to get rid of most infections. And it does so very early on. How many of you have taken Moshewitz's uh, immunology course? OK, so you know all of this very well. And it's only when this system is down that we have problems. If you have AIDS, if you are immunosuppressed for an organ transplant, or if you have some other kind of virus infection, like a measles infection that naturally immunosuppresses, then a very common virus infection, like a common cold, can be lethal. So you really have to be grateful to your immune system for this great protection that we have, because we're continuously uh, bombarded with viruses. So all of you in this room are likely in, to be infected with at least two of all of these herpes viruses. Is that right, Dr. Silverstein? At least two. So among the more common ones, herpes simplex viruses, uh, varicella zoster, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus. All of you have at least two of these and perhaps more. And once you're infected with these, as you'll hear from uh, Dr. Silverstein, it's for life. You can't get rid of the infection. As I said earlier, we have viral genetic sequences integrated into our genetic material. And these are illustrations of different such sequences which are related to retroviruses, a particular class of virus that integrates its genetic material into cellular DNA. And these range from nearly complete retroviral genomes, which we call endogenous retroviruses, to different forms. And we'll learn more about these later. These all have different names, as you can see here, uh, lines and signs and so forth. And here is the interesting number. The, the number of copies of each of these integrated into our genomes, ranging from 100 to hundreds of thousands to a million or more. 42% of your DNA is, like, is derived from retroviral sequences. 42%, almost half of your genome. So when the genome was sequenced, they found all of these littered throughout the genome. These are remnants of infections that happened millions and millions of years ago. And they've been around a long time, and not just hominids, but precursors to them as well. And they're not producing viruses anymore, but they're still there. And it's an interesting question to try and understand why uh, these are still present. Now, this is a map of the human microbiome. Uh, you may know that the U.S. has started a microbiome project, the goal of which is to identify the microbial composition at all of these different body sites. And what is shown here is a little pie chart showing the composition in terms of bacterial species at each of these sites. So not just the skin and the intestine, but different parts of the skin and different folds of flesh at all. And you can see that they vary significantly in the composition. As well, the bacterial composition exists in our guts, in our mouths, and in various other places. Each of those bacteria, which are amazingly important for our well-being, also have their complement of viruses. Bacteriophages infect them. So we're loaded with viruses on our, in our microbiome. And in addition to this, we're all colonized with a variety of viruses in our respiratory tracts and in our GI tracts as well. But not all viruses make you sick. 
Many of us are afraid of them because of the scepter of very bad disease. But it turns out the more we study them and the more we learn how to find them when they don't make you sick, that they don't have any effect at us, on us at all. And here is an example. About 70 to 90% of everyone is infected with a small DNA virus called JC virus. It's shown up here. It's in the polyomavirus family. And as far as we can tell, if you have a healthy immune system, this infection has no consequence to you whatsoever. You're fine. You can actually look at the different uh, types of this virus in human populations and use that to track the migration of humans over time. And that's what this map shows. This is uh, a map of human migration starting in Africa. Uh, according, if you by the genome sequence, so sequences of many different cultures have been sequenced, and you can sh use that to show how uh, hu humans moved out of Africa into Europe, Asia, Australia, and South America. And if you look at the viruses, these JC viruses that people harbor, you can also get an idea of migration as well. It's slightly different. You can see it starts in Africa, uh, and it goes to North America rather than South America. Just an illustration of what you can do with this virus information, but also the fact is that this virus is fine. It doesn't hurt us whatsoever. It may do something positive for us, in fact, but we don't know what that might be. There are many other examples of good viruses. And one of them, one of my favorites is a virus that's established in a plant. And the, this is a certain species of, of grass that grows very well at temperatures higher than 50 degrees centigrade. And these kind of conditions often occur around hot springs like you would find out at Yellowstone. These grasses grow right by the hot water. The ability of these grasses to survive high temperatures depends on them being colonized by a fungus, Curvularia protuberata. And that fungus, in turn, has to be infected with a virus. So if you take the virus out of the fungus, and, and leave the fungus in it cannot survive at 50 degrees. Uh, if you take the fungus out, it will not survive as well. You have to have both, both the fungus and the plant. So the plant gets to live at high temperatures and it provides a home for the fungus and for the virus as well. There are many examples of this out in nature. It's really fascinating. So basically, viruses are amazing. And what I want to do in this course is to tell you why I think they're amazing and how they get to be so amazing. So how are we going to do that? So this course is probably different from a lot of other virology courses, and we try and teach you the big picture. We try and teach it by process. I'm not going to teach you a lecture on influenza and a lecture on herpes and a lecture on smallpox, because I don't think that's the way to learn introductory virology. I think you need to first learn the principles, the big picture, and that's what we're going to do in this course. If you learn virus by virus, you just learn about isolated collections of viruses and diseases, and it doesn't make any unifying sense. We want to unify everything for you so that you can read about a new virus in the future and instantly understand what's going on. And I really want you to understand that if you, if you understand viruses, you won't be afraid of them. The public, for the most part, is afraid of viruses because they don't understand them. And what they do know about them, they get from the popular press and from movies. And it's mostly wrong and it's scary. Because after all, those sources have to make money and they do so by scaring you. If they told you the truth, it wouldn't be interesting and they wouldn't make any money. So I want to tell you why viruses are, are cool and interesting. And, and the result is you're gonna, I'm going to have 80 people go out into the world who appreciate them and understand what's going on and can make informed decisions about, say, vaccination issues or other health-related issues you might encounter one day. Now, the, the way we teach virology in this course is based on a unif some unifying principles. And there's a three-part strategy that, all, that we see that all viruses do. And it's shown here. First, that all viruses have a genome and that is encased in a particle. And the particle is a protective device that allows the genome to be transmitted from one cell to another. So all viruses that we're going to talk about do that. Secondly, that genome, of course, has all the information to make new virus particles. And finally, these genomes establish themselves in host populations. They have the means to do so. So it's really all about the genome 
the particle that the, the coat that surrounds the genome is is just a carrier. The genome has all the information to to reproduce and to establish itself in populations, but it can't do this on its own. Viruses are parasites. They can only function in a host cell. No virus particle can reproduce outside of a host cell. And it's really the genome that's the parasite because the, the capsid or the coating is shed as soon as the nucleic acid gets into the cell. So the virus, gene, the virus genome is a parasite. It requires the cell. And even more fundamentally, all viruses have to make messenger RNA. This is a central requirement for all viruses to reproduce because that messenger RNA is going to be translated by the host cell. No virus can translate proteins from messenger RNA. The cell has to do that all the time. So each virus, no matter how diverse the genome is, has to be able to make uh, mRNA. And because viruses are parasites, <clears throat> studying them not only tells you about them, but it tells you about the cell that you're studying or even the organism. And a lot of the advances in biology that we have made uh, in the last 40 years have come from studying viruses, which identify processes that we wouldn't have come up with before. So you can learn about cell biology by studying viruses, and we'll have lots of examples of that in this course. And you can also learn about organismal biology, the specific traits of the various organisms that are infected by viruses. Now, one thing I'd like to warn you about uh, in this course is try not to anthropomorphize viruses. Don't have them doing things. They have no consciousness, of course, and they don't want to do anything. Everything that happens in a, in a viral life cycle is a reaction. So for two reasons, I don't, I don't want you to anthropomorphize viruses. One, because it's not correct, and it's just strange to say viruses employ this strategy or exhibit this or display. But the other is that if you avoid that, it helps you to realize how viruses work. They make huge numbers of, of particles, as we already have heard, and among those are many, many mutants. So when viruses replicate, they just spawn mutants left and right all the time, constantly. So this is your first lesson. When you, listen, when you read a paper or listen to a news report and they say the virus has mutated, that's totally wrong because they're always mutated. Okay. And they mutate because they want to adapt to a new specific environment. Wherever the virus happens to be, the best fit of those mutants' uh, viruses are going to survive. And it's not because they want to. They don't want to infect you and cause disease. That just happens. Yes? Um, all the viral are two-sided reactions, but so does everything. Like, everything is reaction. Yeah, that's right. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, but we have the ability to direct, right, what happens we, and be conscious. Viruses can't do that. They just make lots of mutants, and then the best adapted one survives. And then in the next round, they make more, and that just goes on and on. That's how I want you to view viruses. There's no consciousness. There's no selection. There's just, just, it's just Darwinian evolution, basically. But you're right. Everything is, in, in a sense, a, a chemical reaction, but uh, obviously higher order uh, life forms have the ability to direct what happens. So viruses are a great example of Darwinian machines. They make lots of mutants in a really quick time, more than any other organism on the planet. And some people find this very difficult to understand. Humans, we, it takes almost a year to make a new human. Evolution is really slow. Plus, we're DNA-based organisms, so we don't mutate that quickly. Among the viruses, those with RNA genomes mutate incredibly rapidly. Some of them have generation times of a few hours. So you can make huge numbers of mutants, and the selections that occur are almost uh, overnight. It's really remarkable. We will talk about this in more detail in one lecture. And in conjunction with this, I want you to think of the conundrum that a virus has. Of the virus, if it has any goal, it is to survive and propagate. So they wouldn't exist if they weren't successful at that. At killing the host is not a good strategy to propagate. And as you will see, often the, the effects in a host of a virus infection, the pathology and sometimes even the death, is an indirect effect of what the virus does. It's the host responses. Often the immune response does more damage than the virus itself. 
So the virus wants to reach a balance or wants to evolve to reach a balance where it replicates in the host but doesn't eliminate the host. And of course, it doesn't want to replicate poorly but because then the host will eliminate it as well. And so this balance has been selected over many, many years of evolution. So when we're done with this course in May, when the weather is a lot warmer than in, it is now, you'll know a lot more about cells because all the viral processes will illuminate that. You'll understand how viral genomes encode and decode information. There are many different types of viral genome. We just have a DNA genome, double-stranded DNA, but viruses have all different kinds. And you'll, you'll understand how to get genetic information out of that. And then we will also understand how viruses cause disease. That's what's called viral pathogenesis. Uh, in addition, you'll be able to look at CNN and know when they are full of it, which as, as far as it goes with virology, they are most of the time. Here is a, a screen capture from 2009. Uh, back then, a new pandemic strain of influenza emerged, the H1N1 swine origin uh, influenza. And a, a few groups did some studies in ferrets. Ferrets are a good animal model for studying flu. And what they found was that when you infect ferrets with, with that strain of virus, it was lethal. It destroyed their lungs and killed the ferrets. So this uh, news guy here is saying, uh, putting these results as if it's going to happen to people. It ravages your lungs. Swine flu is different. And this, has, this is totally wrong because it's an animal model. And in fact, after a year of experience, we found out that that strain of flu is quite mild in people. In fact. So often the press gets it wrong. And one of the things I'd like you to do is come out of here and be able to detect that. In fact, some of you may write stories like this one day. Who knows? I want you to get it right. I have contacts with lots of journalists who are always talking to me about this, but I can't talk to all of them, of course. But if I send uh, a number of you out every year with knowledge about this, it will help. Uh, very recently in the New York Times, there was an editorial that totally drove me crazy. It was on January 7th, called An Engineered Doomsday. And this is with respect to some influenza experiments that have been going on recently, which we'll talk about, uh, which involve avian influenza, which is a bird flu, but is, we worry that it might infect people. In a lab in the Netherlands and at the University of Wisconsin did some experiments that made this virus more transmissible among ferrets, okay? Ferret, you can't do these experiments in people. So they did it in ferrets. And people are going crazy because they're worried that this would, could be used as an agent of bioterrorism. And the New York Times came out and said, this is a terrible virus, and it could kill tens or hundreds of millions of people if it escaped confinement. There's no way of saying that. There's just no way you can say it can kill tens or hundreds of millions of people. So they don't want to publish this data. And in fact, all of the arguments they use are wrong. So I want you to be able to read an editorial like this or a news article in the future when you're done with this course and pick out why it is wrong. In fact, one of the things I'm going to have you do at the end of this course, I give you a couple of opportunities for extra credit. I want you to go watch the movie Contagion and write three things that are wrong with it, okay? Because <laughs> there are many things wrong, but I want... But you will find at the end of this course all the things that are wrong with it. Not, I mean scientific things. There, there are other things wrong with it. I don't care about those. Okay, so in this course we're mostly going to talk about viruses that infect animals. But as I told you, there are viruses of every living thing and it's really a shame we can't talk about them all. We'll talk a little bit about bacterial viruses, but we don't have time. It's a whole other course to talk about the other viruses, but there's some pretty interesting ones. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, the beginnings of virology. We have a, a whole lecture on evolution later on, but I just want to tell you today how old we think viruses are. We think that we know that they were around uh, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, which was up to about 250 million years ago. How do we know that? Well, we have ways now of, of, of sequencing and doing what we call ca calculating a molecular clock. We can sequence different isolates of a virus that are uh, spaced apart in time and use the difference to calculate back uh, how far these, these uh, viruses were present. And from that, we can say that some of the herpes viruses probably infected dinosaurs. Can you imagine dinosaurs had fever sores uh, back then? We can also sequence these integrated sequences in our genome. And, and animals have not only retroviral sequences, but they have 
sequences of other viruses as well. And if you combine that with genome sequences of phylogenetically related species, you can then trace back when the integration event occurs. And some of these happened millions and millions of years ago. So they've been around a long time. I suspect they were probably the first things to develop on Earth many, many years ago, uh, predating cellular life. And we'll talk more about that later on. There is some very early recorded history which suggests that virus infections were present 700 BC, there's this, uh, um, this, this vase, and on it's written, um, here this firebrand, rabid Hector leads the charge. That's from the Iliad by Homer. And that probably refers to the disease caused by rabies virus, but of course we can't be sure. Uh, this is an Egyptian carving from uh, about 1500 to 1300 BC, and this depicts a young priest with a leg that appears to be withered as it, as it is caused by polio today. So this could be one of the first cases of polio on record. But again, we can't be sure. Uh, it's very difficult to get archival material and still find viruses present. You can find bacteria present on very old uh, burial specimens, but not yet viruses. In, in, in as early as the 11th century, people were practicing prevention of, of infections, of course we didn't know there were viruses back then, without knowing anything about the agent. So people would get sick and very smart people would observe that whoever survived these sicknesses never got sick in that specific way again. And smallpox was one of the big killers uh, back then and people in China observed that whoever got this disease never got it again. So they practiced they practice what was called variolation, where they would take pus from an infected person and inoculate that into someone else. And it was the earliest forms of vaccination. Now, of course, the problem there is that a lot of those people died because they're using the virulent virus that causes disease. But that was carried out for a long time. Uh, the, young, the lady here is Lady Montague. So she brought this practice to the UK uh, in the 1700s. Uh, her husband was ambassador to Turkey, and in Turkey they were doing this variolation. So she saw it, she went back, and she said, this is a good idea, because there was a lot of smallpox in the UK at the time. Uh, even here in the colonies, John Adams famously used this procedure to inoculate his kids uh, and protect them against infection. And it wasn't until the 1790s that Edward Jenner changed this, so instead of using a virulent virus, he made the observation that milkmaids got cowpox, they got lesions on their hand, and they never got smallpox. So he said, whatever the agent is, it must be similar to the one that infects people. So he used cowpox as an immunogen for a young boy and proved, and he established vaccination, in fact. So we'll talk a lot more about this in our lecture on immunology. But if you think that the anti-vaccine movement is new, here is a uh, an etching from Jenner's time, the late 1790s. So he had started immunizing people against smallpox using cowpox, and immediately people said, this is not good, you're gonna grow cow parts wherever uh, Jenner uses his vaccine on you. First anti-vax. Okay, so to set the stage for uh, when the first viruses were discovered, let's let's talk about what microbiology was like at the time, because virology is, of course, a field of microbiology. And we start with Anton von Leeuwenhoek, uh, who was um, a Dutch lens maker in the 1600s, and he made the first microscopes. You can see one of them here. These are very famous. Yes, there's a museum over there in Amsterdam where you can see all of these. They're pretty cool. And he was the first person to see really tiny things in all kinds of specimens. And no one knew that these things existed. They just knew what they could see, uh, people and plants and insects. But he said, there are microorganisms in the water and in all kinds of fluids, even in your body. And so that was the first time we, we saw that there were things smaller than what we could see with our eyes. Uh, he was then followed by Pasteur, Louis Pasteur here, uh, in the later 1800s, who said that microorganisms don't arise by spontaneous generation. They, they multiply. These are living things. It was a huge debate between him and the proponents of, of spontaneous generation. And his famous experiment was to take this swan-necked flask. He boiled the broth inside and showed that it never 
grew bacteria unless he put the bacteria in. And that's because, of course, the neck is curved in a way so that the bacteria in the air can't get in. So he said microorganisms are living and they multiply. And then finally, this brings us to Robert Koch, who uh, lived late, a bit later than Pasteur. And Koch was the first to establish the germ theory of disease. He said microorganisms can cause human disease. And he established a set of requirements to prove that any particular bacterium caused a disease. And these are, of course, called Koch's postulates. All right, so this is where we are at the end uh, of the 19th century. We have knowledge of bacteria, but no viruses yet. And we start our viral trip with this disease of tobacco. And as you know, humans have been farming tobacco for many, many years. And as long as they have been doing that, tobacco has a, had a disease called tobacco mosaic disease. And towards the end of the 1800s, many people were trying to figure out what was causing this disease because it had, it had economic consequences. It destroyed the leaves and you couldn't sell them. And a couple of scientists in Europe were working on this. And what they would do is grind up the leaf and make an extract of it and try and transmit the disease to another plant. And what they did was to use filters. These were porcelain filters with very, very small pores, which were by then known to exclude bacteria. So the work of, of Pasteur and Koch had shown that you could filter out bacteria with these kinds of apparatuses. Uh, and so if you put some extract up here and filtered it through, what came down here would be free of bacteria, but on top it would be all the bacteria stuck to the filter. So two different individuals, Ivanovsky in, in Russia and Beyerink in Holland, at the end of the uh, 1800s, decided that uh, they would do this with tobacco mosaic, ground up leaves. They filtered it through this porcelain filter. And much to their surprise, what came through the filter, if you took that and rubbed it on a fresh leaf, would cause disease. So they said, wow, this is a really small organism, whatever it is. Um, much smaller than bacteria because it goes through the filter. What they also found was that if you just incubated this extract by itself, the agent, whatever it was, did not grow. So they said it's really small and it doesn't grow unless you put it back on a new host. And that was different from what bacteria were because if you put bacteria in here, of course, they could grow on their own without a host cell. So those were the first discoveries of viruses at the end of the 1800s with this tobacco mosaic virus disease. Uh, the first animal virus was discovered in 1898. That's a virus that causes foot and mouth disease, a disease of cattle. It causes lesions in the mouth and on the feet of cattle. So this has great economic consequences. And the, in all of these cases, again, the definition of a virus is that they're small. They went through this filter and they only replicated in the host, not in just broth as bacteria do. Now these filters were crude back then, but the size, the exclusion size was roughly 0.2 micron. A micrometer is about a millionth of a meter. And so that was the working definition of viruses for many years, something that will go through a 0.2 micron filter. And here are just some of the virus discoveries to sort of give you a historical perspective about some of the viruses we're going to talk about today. The first human virus in 19, 1901, yellow fever virus, a mosquito-borne disease. Rabies virus, 1903. Variola, the agent of smallpox. Uh, the first cancer virus, chicken leukemia virus and polio virus in 1908. Uh, another cancer-causing virus, 1911, Rouse sarcoma virus. This virus called so caused solid tumors, and we'll talk a lot about this virus subsequently. Bacteriophages, viruses that infect bacteria, 1915, and influenza virus, pretty recently, uh, 1933. So the name virus is a Latin derivative. It means toxin or poison. So the early People who discovered these agents weren't really quite sure what they were. They didn't know that they were particulate. That was actually not discovered until many, many years later, so they called them a toxin or a poison, even though they are not poisons. They are particulate objects, of course. 
And in this course, we'll talk about viruses, but I will also use the term virion, and it means something very specific. It means the infectious particle. All right, it has to be infectious to be a virion. It's the complete virus particle, but it's also infectious. And the reason we distinguish this is because many virus particles, as they're made in cells, are not infectious for a variety of reasons, and they're not virions. So virion refers to the infectious particle. So in the 1930s, the electron microscope was developed, and then for the first time, people could actually see what these viruses looked like. And they were amazed at the diversity and the sheer beauty of, of the different viruses. As you can see some of them here. Uh, here is a, a bacteriophage. This is one of the so-called T-even bacteriophages, T2, T4. These infect bacteria, of course, and they have this wonderful uh, DNA injection machine structure. Uh, this is the tobacco mosaic virus, seen for the first time in the 1930s, the first virus discovered. Uh, here we have a relative of rabies virus. It's called vesicular stomatitis virus. It causes lesions on cows. People generally don't like to work on rabies in the lab because it's quite dangerous, so instead they work on this virus. And here we have rotaviruses. These are pretty recently discovered viruses that cause gastroenteritis, and we'll talk about that much later. We know a lot of details by now about viruses from their first discovery just over 100 years ago. We know three-dimensional structures of many viruses. So this is a model of the three-dimensional structure of poliovirus, which happens to be the virus that I've worked on for many years. These are, these are models where you derive the XYZ coordinate of every amino acid, every atom in the particle, and then you use a computer to build the model. And these are at two different resolutions. You can see, so you have very high resolution here and, and lower resolution here. But you can see the surface of the particle is not smooth. It has shapes, and these have biological functions. We even know the chemical formula, of course, for polio. We know the sequence of the genome. So from that, we can determine the number of carbons, hydrogens, nitrogens, oxygens, phosphorus, and sulfur. The sulfur, of course, in the amino acids. So what are they, though, in the end? What is a virus? So we have a number of definitions. They're very small. Remember, initially, 0.2, they could go through a 0.2 micron filter, but that, as you'll see in a minute, doesn't hold anymore. They are parasites, which means simply something that benefits at the expense of something else. So the virus has to get into a cell in order to multiply. It's a parasite cell. It takes something away from the cell. Now, I don't think they are living, but this is actually a debate that is ongoing and is a debate worth having, but I have settled on the non-living part. Um, we will, this is something you can think about throughout the course and come to your own conclusion at the end. Many people feel viruses are living, but I think they are just chemicals. A virus particle on its own, if this were a virus, can't do anything. It would just sit on the table for as long as it were stable, and it can't do a thing until it gets into a cell. So I don't think it's living. Now, once it infects a cell, you could say that the, the virus-infected cell is living. That would be correct. But I think the virus particle itself is not. You can't just add water to it and have it come alive like a seed, for example. They always need cellular hosts. So this is a very important concept, that the, all viruses need to get into cellular hosts in order to multiply. They don't do anything when outside of the host. Yes? That's a good question. So what, what I think is that what predated cellular life were, were bits of nucleic acid in the primordial soup that had some ability to replicate. Very, very crude replication schemes, nothing like we have today. So it really is very different. And some people think that those were first and then cells derived from them. I mean, of course, we, we don't know. We can't prove it. It's just a hypothesis. So I put up a poll on my blog some time ago, a couple of years ago, are viruses alive? Because we always talk about this. I have lots of listeners who always email. I got one yesterday from someone who said, I am the smartest person in the world, and I think viruses are living. <laughs> so people, people have interesting opinions. Now, so we've had so far 3,300 uh, votes here, and you should go and, and vote as well. And you can see the no's have a little edge so far, but it's pretty close between yes, no, and something in between. I don't know what the something in between would be, but I put it on anyway. And then 6% have no idea. 
So very small. That's one of the attributes of viruses. So let's talk a bit about that. Uh, here on the lower left is an E. coli. And infecting that E. coli is a bacteriophage. So this is about 100,000 magnification. And tobacco mosaic virus is here. So you can see it's smaller than an E. coli, but not hugely smaller. Uh, HIV-1 is here. So that's a relatively large uh, animal virus. And then everything that's on this panel is here. So all this is really small. So uh, here on this panel is a carbon atom right here. So you can barely see that, of course, compared to E. coli. A ribosome would be there. And here is poliovirus. So polio is about the size of a cellular ribosome. And these are, these are, multi these are um, magnified a million times. So all of these viruses could go through a 0.2 micron filter very easily. Here's another way of looking at this. This is a generic eukaryotic cell with its nucleus and all the various organelles and membranes inside of it. And outside of it are two different kinds of viruses, a herpes virus, which is the big one, and poliovirus, which is much smaller. And we'll magnify that, look at it on the right here. And now you can see polio, about the same size as ribosomes. So polio is 30 nanometers in diameter, ribosomes are 20. And here's the herpes virus, about 10 times bigger than the ribosome but this would fit through a 0.2 micron filter. So in, you can see with respect to a cell, um, viruses are quite small. The old question, how many viruses can you put on the head of a pin, of course depends on what virus you're talking about. From the smallest, about 20 nanometers, up to the biggest, as you'll see, 750 nanometers. So here's a pin head right here, which is about 2,000 microns uh, in diameter. It's much bigger than the 0.2 micron cutoff of the filter. And on this is a dust mite, which is clearly visible. And then here, this is a hair laid across it. And then here is a collection of things which you can barely see. And among those things which are magnified here, there is a, uh, there's a lymphocyte, a yeast cell, a couple of red blood cells. These are bacteria, rod-shaped and spherical bacteria. And then here are the viruses, which you can barely see. So they are quite small. Rhinoviruses, you could put 500 million on a pinhead. So whenever you sneeze, you are shooting out hundreds of millions of rhinoviruses. And you could potentially infect thousands of people. But most of the time, you don't sneeze on thousands of people. And the viruses fall to the earth and, and get inactivated. Now, only a few years ago, a very different virus was discovered that changes all of this because it's huge. And you can actually see this virus under a light microscope. So this is a picture of a cell infected with these viruses, which are called Mimi viruses. And the Mimi viruses are these dark spots here. This happens to be an electron micrograph, but you can see these in cells by visible light microscopy. And these viruses are huge. Uh, just as an example, here is a diagram of one of these Mimi viruses. Their natural host in nature are amoeba. And that's where they were first. They were first discovered in a French water cooling tower that happened to be contaminated with amoeba. And they were actually thought to be bacteria initially because they were so big. Uh, so they have a capsid, which is about 400 nanometers in diameter. And they have these fibrils around it, which make it about a total of seven to 800 nanometers in diameter. So these would not go through a 0.2 micron filter. So they would have been missed in the first experiments. Uh, many, many years ago. These are huge viruses, and there are many others like it now that we've discovered. They have DNA genomes, and they are among the biggest that we know of. This particular Mimi virus, the DNA genome is 1.2 million bases long, base pairs. This is longer than some bacterial genomes, and it encodes an incredible array of what we used to think were only cellular proteins, like tRNA synthetases, and a bunch of enzymes in, involved in sugar and lipid metabolism. No virus has any of these. Now, these viruses can't translate their mRNAs. They're, they don't have the complete translation system. But they may be something uh, in evolution that gives us clues about where viruses came from. So we'll come back to these later. But for now, I want you to understand that the 0.2 micron cutoff doesn't apply anymore. So viruses can have either a DNA or an RNA genome. We'll talk about that a lot in this course. That genome gets into a host cell. 
It directs the synthesis of everything needed to make new virus particles. And these particles are made by assembly. You make the parts and you assemble new viruses. That, those particles, as I said before, help transmit the genome from one cell to another. And in the next cell, the genome comes out of the shell and starts this whole process over again. So if you study viruses, as I said before, you learn about the cell because the virus gets into the cell and uses many, many aspects of what a cell provides. All the energy that viruses require for all of these activities come from the cell. No virus can make any kind of energy whatsoever. Viruses have to be transported around the cell. They have to be tr transported in. Some of them go as far as the nucleus. And then when they're made, they get transported out. And this uses cellular transport pathways that involve the cytoskeleton. Uh, all sorts of protein synthetic modifications are done by the cell, lipid synthesis. So the virus is entirely dependent on the cell for all of these processes. An important point that I want you to understand is that this idea of how viruses multiply by assembly lines. Now, if you take a bacterium and you inoculate a culture with a single bacterium, you know after a suitable amount of time the bacteria divides in two. You know, have two bacteria, then you get four and eight and 16 and so on. This is binary fission. When viruses were first discovered, many people thought this was how they multiplied, but it's not true. It turns out that viruses do not multiply by binary fission. When a virus infects a cell, it makes components to assemble the many, many new viruses, not just two. So you make the parts, assemble the final product. And we will look at the replication of viruses in a few lectures to understand how we learn that. But for now, please realize that viruses don't use binary fission. See, I've used the word use for viruses. But they are assembled in a stepwise fashion. We classify viruses very specifically. You're going to see a lot of these names throughout the course. So just so that you are familiar with what you're looking at, we use a very classical hierarchical classification system, which is used for classifying living things as well, kingdom, phylum, class. The viruses are included in orders, families, genera, and species. So for example, polioviruses and rhinoviruses are species in the genus Enterovirus, and then there's a family name, Picornavirus or Picornaviridae just to, so that you understand these terms when you encounter them. How do you classify viruses is a very interesting question. There are a number of criteria, and viruses come in all shapes and sizes, as you can see. The sequence, the kind of nucleic acid and its sequence is very important. Uh, the, the, the capsid, you can see some capsids are very distinct uh, from others. Whether there's a lipid envelope or not. So here is a virus, influenza virus with a lipid envelope. And here is a virus that has none whatsoever. It's composed purely of protein. And finally, the dimensions also go into classifying the viruses. Some of you can see are very small. And the Mimi viruses are huge. The uh, business of classifying viruses is done by a committee called the ICTV, which is the International Committee for the Nomenclature of, for the Taxonomy of Viruses. They have a website. And so far, they have classified 40,000 different virus isolates into these orders, families, and genera, and so forth. But that's just nothing. That's a teaspoonful of viruses. Because as I said, there are so many viruses out there. And most of them are, are novel and unknown. So the classification is, is very elementary. But I just want you to know that it, it does exist. Now let me give you two examples of what we can do. We can do in terms of virus discovery. In the last several years, technologies for detecting nucleic acids have really been refined. So we can do really rapid sequencing at very low cost. And now what people do in, is go into various environments, take samples, and just sequence total nucleic acid and see what's there. And then apply bioinformatics to figure out what the sequences mean. So in fact, virology is transitioning from a discipline where we used to do only wet bench experiments, where now there's a whole new area for bioinformaticians where you sit in front of a computer screen and you look at viruses in that way. So here's an example of a study which was done in a lake in Antarctica. This is called Lake Limnopolar. It's a freshwater lake which is frozen most of the year under ice. In the spring it does thaw out and there's a little bit of fresh water. And these, these individuals drilled a hole in the ice and they took some fresh water out 
and they brought it back to the lab and they sequenced it. They wanted to know what kinds of viruses were present. So this is, this is interesting because it's an environment that's underneath ice most of the time and has a very limited microbial community. So they found 10,000 new species of viruses in this lake, just sequencing them, 12 different families, uh, and so the diversity is amazing. And it just is just one lake in a, in a restricted area. So these kinds of studies go on all the time. Another very interesting one was a study of what viruses are present in raw sewage. So these individuals went to three different sewage treatment plants, uh, one in Pittsburgh, um, one in Barcelona, and one in Abu Dhabi, I believe. And they collected 10 liters of sewage, a big vat. They brought it back to their lab. They purified virions extracted the DNA and did what's called pyrosequencing. This is a special way of getting a lot of sequence information in a short time. And they looked in the electron microscope at these samples, and you can see some of the pictures here. You can see virus particles are present in raw sewage. And these are bacteriophages. These are viruses that infect us, viruses that infect plants, and viruses that infect insects as well. And when you look at all the sequences, so this pie chart uh, shows you all the different sequences they found. This is the number of sequence runs. So the vast majority, over 596,000. So these are individual sequence runs were maybe a few hundred nucleotides in length. Most of them were unknown. These are viruses, you can tell in certain ways, but totally new viruses, never seen them before. Uh, they got a lot of bacteria sequence here. They got some fungi, some human sequence, and they got some known viruses, 8,000 known viruses and 30, 37,000 uh, known bacterial viruses. So this is in human sewage. So this is material that passes through our intestinal tract. The viruses come from us. We harbor them in us, our bacteria. If you eat plants, there are viruses associated with them uh, as well. So this is a whole new area for virology. People do this all the time in different environments. And anything you can think of is fair game. People do doorknobs in buildings. They go into subways and take the rats and look at the viruses in the rats. It's an interesting question. What are the viruses around us? Now, the key question we're going to look at in the next uh, two lectures is the viral genome. And it was only in the 1950s that it was recognized that the nucleic acid in the particle, that is either DNA or RNA, was actually the genetic information. Now, you may remember that in the 1940s, for bacteria, it had been shown that uh, DNA was the genetic information. There was a big debate about whether it would be protein or DNA, but it hadn't yet been decided for viruses. It was shown in the 1950s, and today this seems elementary, but this sparked the molecular biology revolution, the finding that viral DNA is genetic information. And let me show you the experiment that was used, a really famous experiment that involves a wearing blender made famous by Al Hershey and Martha Chase in 1952. They used bacteriophages and infected bacteria. And what they did was that they labeled either the phage protein or the phage DNA with either uh, S35 or with P32. And they ask, when you label radioactively these components, where do they end up after infection? So here's our protein labeled virus and our DNA labeled virus. They allowed these viruses to infect cells very briefly, just five minutes, and then they put them in a wearing blender and that sheared the phages off from the bacteria. And then they separated the bacteria and asked, where is the radioactivity? So if they used phages labeled in protein, uh, there was never any radioactivity associated with the cells. It was always in the supernatant and ne never any radioactivity detected in the next generation of phage. In contrast, when they labeled the viral DNA, the viral DNA got into the bacteria. They could tell by counting the bacteria. And the next generation of phage would have radioactivity in their DNA as well. So that proved that the DNA got into cells and directed the synthesis of, of more progeny phage. So that was 1952. The next year, 1953, the structure of DNA was solved by Watson and Crick with, with a lot of help from Rosalind Franklin. And that was the beginning of molecular biology. 
Now, when we talk about all the different kinds of viruses, it's going to be a little bit confusing because there are so many of them, but there is one thing that will keep it all straight for you, and that is to remember that every virus has to make mRNA. Just keep RNA, mRNA central to your thinking, and you will have an easier time of understanding all these genomes. So there, there are lots of different viruses we're going to talk about, different strategies, but they all have to make mRNA. Okay. And this thinking was used by David Baltimore, a Nobel laureate, for discovering a, a very important enzyme, reverse transcriptase, in tumor viruses. He used this thinking to organize all the different kinds of viral genome into a scheme that really unified our thinking about viruses. So he said, I'm going to put mRNA at the middle, and that's what he did here. And he said, I'm going to put all the different kinds of viral genome around it, and from that we can figure out how they get to mRNA. So you can see there are viruses with DNA genomes here, double-stranded uh, of various kinds, single-stranded, and then there are a variety of RNA genomes. And he said all of these have to get to mRNA, and that's, this is the pathway that each one of them have to take. Now, when we, when we show, look at these figures in subsequent classes, I always use a color scheme and a nomenclature. So let's make sure we all are on the same starting point. I'm going to talk a lot about plus strand mRNAs, and that's simply a convention. It has nothing to do with electrical charge. It was, a num it was a name given to the mRNA many years ago by someone, and it stuck. So the mRNA is defined as the plus strand, okay? So by definition, the opposite strand or the complementary strand is the minus strand. It's the strand that is not translated. So plus strand can be translated, <coughs> minus strand cannot. We'll also use a color scheme to illustrate nucleic acids. DNAs are in blue, two different shades for the two strands. Same for RNA uh, in green, and two different colors for the plus and minus strands. So our mRNA is this uh, olive-colored green, and the minus strand is brownish. So if you just think that you have to get to mRNA, if I give you any genome type, you can figure out really easily how to get there. So for example, if I give you double-stranded DNA, it's just one step to mRNA because enzymes copy double-stranded DNA and make mRNA out of it. And you'll find out also that if I say, how do you get from single-stranded DNA to mRNA, the first step is to make a double-strand because single-stranded DNA can't be copied by itself into mRNA. There's also a class of viruses, the hepatitis B viruses, that are double-stranded, but they have gaps in their DNA. Why that's so will be obvious a bit later. And again, the enzyme that makes mRNA can't handle those gaps. They have to be filled in first to make a perfectly double-stranded DNA molecule. How about the RNA viruses? How do they get to mRNA? Well, <clears throat> uh, some of them are already plus mRNA, and as you will see, they can be translated directly. But in order to make more genomes, they have to go through a negative stranded intermediate from which you can make more plus mRNA. Some RNA viruses have double-stranded genomic RNA, shown here, and you can make mRNA directly from that. And finally, some viruses carry negative stranded RNA in their genome. And that's an easy step from that to mRNA. You simply make the complement strand. So you can see from all of these different genome types, and this is everything, these are seven different types of viral genome that exist. I promise you there are no more. Maybe you could think of other ones, but we haven't found them. And it's very easy to go from seven different genome types to mRNA. It will really help you understand how these viruses replicate. So here are the seven different classes of viral genome. We have our double-stranded DNA, gapped double-strand, single-stranded DNA, and then we have our RNA genomes, double-stranded RNA, and then two different kinds of single strands, either plus or minus, right? Remember, the plus is the mRNA and the minus is the complement. And finally, a really unusual scheme. We have viruses that are plus single-stranded RNA, but that RNA is not translated. It's made into a DNA copy, which then uh, goes on to produce mRNA. So that's the trickiest one, because for all the others, it makes logical sense. But 
for these viruses with plus-stranded RNAs, uh, they, they go through DNA intermediate, and unfortunately, you're just going to have to remember that. So that's the, the Baltimore scheme that organized all of this. And next time, we're going to start looking at each of these genomes and understanding how they replicate. Any, any questions? By the way, as you know, you can ask questions throughout the lecture. I'm happy to entertain any of them. Any other questions for today before we leave? Okay, see you Monday.